want to welcome our guest, uh, James Katulis. He is the CEO of Typhon Capital Management. It's a CTA CPO which operates several niche trading strategies, uh, including, and forgive me if I'm not pronouncing all this right, but Metis Momentum Macro Program, uh, Plutus Grain Strategy, Toros Livestock Strategy, Travinci Liquid Egg Strategy, and the Proteus Dynamic Volatility Program. Uh, Mr. Katulis is also the president and co-founder of the Commodity Customer Co Co Commodity Customer Coalition, a nonprofit customer advocacy organization formed in response to the MF Global Bankruptcy. Mr. Katulis is the lead attorney for the CCC and has represented over 10,000 MF Global customers pro bono in the bankruptcy and helped force the full return of 6.7 billion in customer assets. Mr. Katulis has frequently appeared on CNBC, Bloomberg, and CNN, as well as being featured in major national print publications such as the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Fortune, Forbes, and Reuters, and has written advocacy pieces for Zero Hedge. Mr. Katulis currently serves on the board of directors of the National Futures Association. He has a JD from Northwestern University School of Law and is a member of the Illinois Bar. He serves as, cons as a consulting expert to the Northwestern Investment Protection Clinic and is a member of its advocacy board. Mr. Gertulis also has a degree in finance from the University of Florida where he was a National Merit Scholar, AP National Scholar, and Angelo Lingottis Classic Scholar. Let's welcome Mr. James. Thank you, and uh, just one correction, I actually lost my re-election, so I'm no longer on the board of okay. the National Fusion Association. Um, that was a really fun three years. Uh, but anyway, thanks for having me. It's, it's really cool to come down to U of C, and uh, as a Northwestern grad, they really, they really beat into us this rivalry. Like, our whole first week orientation was like, U of C, they're the worst. Northwestern, we're awesome. And, I mean, it really didn't go beyond that, but it, it culminated in a very intense softball match at uh, U.S. Cellular Field. It's it quite, quite, a, quite a lot of fun, quite a nice intro into Chicago, and we did happen to mercy rule you and the game was stopped. But, uh, you know, other than that, I think UFC is a great school, softball side, um, and, you know, it's, it's fun to come and, and talk to you about trading and markets and, and kind of how um, Typhon got to where it is and, um, and, and, and it's really uh, it's really a lot of fun. And I know some of you guys met our CIO, Dave Klusendorf, and our ball traders, uh, Matt and Mike Thompson, uh, just a couple weeks ago, I think. And uh, I know they thoroughly enjoyed their time here. And uh, hopefully you got some value out of, out of talking with them. Um, but so I kind of took an unconventional route uh, to trading and business and all of that. So. Um, I was a little bit of a computer whiz as a kid, like my dad put me on a computer when I was like three years old and they didn't have hard drive, you know, put in this like floppy disk that was like this big and like put on the computer and like type on like a band line just to get it to start. So it's a little bit different than probably what you guys have grown up with. Um, but I always loved computers and then uh, when the internet was just becoming a thing, like back in like 1994, I was bored one summer, uh, we were actually up here staying with my grandma. And my dad like threw, threw me this book. It was called HTML for Dummies. And this was like the web was barely a thing. Like Netscape, I don't even think was a thing yet. Um, it was all like on, on this uh, browser uh, called Mosaic that was started by uh, Mark Andreessen down at I think uh, University of Illinois. Um, but anyway, I read this book and I was like, I learned how to like code web pages by hand. And this was like writing the full like HTML code and all that stuff, which um, people don't really do that much of anymore. A lot of that's all automated. But anyway, um, I won this like homepage competition for my high school and I got a job offer at this uh, telecom company that, that uh, had, they didn't even have a website yet. Um, and it was, it was pretty cool. Like I was there like 11th hire or something. The company would wind up going public three years later, um, while I was still in high school, I was writing like 
some of the earliest voice over IP um, code. So I got to write like web forms that would let someone in Argentina like put in an access code and a phone number and it would connect to our switch in Florida and originate a call uh, from the US so people in, in a country like Argentina or in Africa or whatever wouldn't have to pay usurious long distance rates. So I mean, it's pretty much the best job a kid could, ha could hope for. And uh, one of the really nice perks I had was um, they essentially are like, we want you to learn what technologies are gonna win and what technologies are gonna lose. And so I was there, I learned like 13 different programming languages, like I learned different graphic design stuff and a um, whole swath of internet technologies. And at the same time, the company was growing, they brought in a CFO um, to go public. That guy's name was Johannes, he was a, uh, an Austrian count with all sorts of like swagger and haberdashery or whatever. <laughs> and uh, um, people in the company like didn't really know what he did because he didn't have a day-to-day -day job. His job was to just bring the company public. And people there didn't really like me because I'd like this, you know, smart mouth 15 year, year old kid who's like writing all the web software. Um, so him and I became like fast friends and we went to lunch every day and he like taught me about trading. And um, he's like, listen, you know, th this internet thing is gonna be a big deal. No one on Wall Street understands it, but like you do. And uh, like he was right. So this, this was kind of the first time in my life that I became familiar with the concept of edge. And edge is really, really important to trading and markets. Um, and, and edge means you've gotta do something better than someone else if, if you wanna make money other than just be, by being lucky. And um, kind, of, kind of one of the old axioms is the three ways to have edge is to be smarter, to be faster, or to cheat. And uh, mm -hmm. if any of you have read Flash Boys, um, a lot of people now are faster, smarter, and maybe they cheat a little bit too. But back, back then, this was like 1995, 1996, high frequency trading wasn't a thing. Um, most orders were still voice brokered, like E-Trade was just coming out and, and some of these online trading platforms. And uh, no one really knew what the internet was. So, you know, granted, every trader looks better in a bull market. It's a lot easier to pick winners when um, stocks are, are generally rising and, and internet stocks sure were rising though, you know, the first kind of three years I was doing it, it we hadn't really got into bubble territory yet. Um, but I, with Johannes' help, I was able to literally bet a thousand trading um, internet and technology stocks. Like I was in Apple at $11 and out at 30, which um, unfortunately was the most expensive car one would ever buy when you cash out to buy such things as, as teenagers, um, you know, might want to do. And this is pre, you know, pre split adjusted too. So like if I would have held on to my Apple for 10 years rather than just buying a car, like probably would have been here right now. <laughs> but that, that, you know, that's how trading was. I mean, he's like, look, you hit a triple. This is awesome. And, and, and generally that is pretty awesome. Um, but anyway, markets were just super, super fun to me. I loved them as much as I loved programming. Um, I was just simply addicted to trading. I just love the idea that you could go out, you could put on, put a, a trade idea on, and get immediate feedback from the market. And tons and tons of factors go into markets. And at the end of the day, like you could make excuses why something should go this way or why something needs to be this way. But at the end of the day, all that matters is the price. Okay, did you buy low and are you gonna sell high or is it going against you or, or um, you know, how, how, however that trade plays out. And as someone who's always loved like computer games, video games and stuff, like markets have always been kind of like a game to me and, and, and they've always been fun. So even now where we're managing um, a, a good chunk of, of other people's money and it's, you know, it's really serious. Like, you know, these people put their trust in you and every single day, like, you, you go to the market not knowing what's gonna happen, um, but trying to, trying to balance making that money um, with minimizing risk, it's still gotta be fun. You know, you still gotta like get excited about it and have like, you know, passion about it. And, and you know, now as a firm, we trade more agricultural commodities, we trade more arcane stuff like the volatility index and global macro and oil prices and day trade currency. And it's, it's, we've come a long way from my days of like buying Apple, right? But um, 
everyone in our firm is just really engaged in that. They really have a passion for markets. They're interested by markets and, and beyond just making money, but the intellectual challenge. Like there's really no greater intellectual challenge than going in to um, a market where millions of other people are all competing with you. Everyone else is trying to make money. Everyone's running their different strategies. Um, some of them are cheating, like whatever. You know, you get the market, um, the same market that everybody else does. And to be able to beat it consistently or to be able to make money consistently is a very, very difficult thing. And um, it's really rewarding when you're able to do that, when you're able to weather storms in the market and, and not get hurt or, or, or you know, outperform your competitors. And it's really, really rewarding when you've got a great year and you knock the cover off the ball and your clients make money and you make money and you're paying bonuses and, and all that. Like, so um, on one end, it's, it, it can be a very feast or famine business. I mean, I've had years where I've worked 100 hour weeks and had net, negative net income on my tax returns. And I've had years where um, the IRS is getting very large checks. Um, and it, you know, it kind of takes a certain mindset to, you know, to trade, to be a trader, to put your own capital at risk, um, to have the responsibility of managing other people's capital. For me, it's even a, a, a more profound responsibility than just putting your own money and trying to like feed your family off, off your own ideas. Like when someone else, um, I think that is, you know, it, it, it's something that we take really seriously. Um, but, but all in all, like, I love the industry. I think, it, you know, it, it's a lot of fun. It can be very intellectual rewarding. Um, but, you know, you gotta see if, it, if it's something for you. But kind of along those lines, like, we're not just traders, like, we're entrepreneurs too. Like, Typhon is a small business. Um, it's something that I started on my credit cards uh, back in 2008. So um, out of law school, I had worked as the COO of a fund of funds consulting firm. It didn't really get off the ground, but I learned I learned a lot of really good lessons from like the way that business was managed that I would then go and apply to Typhon. So something that's that's kind of a constant in both entrepreneurship and trading is you tend to learn more like from your failures than from your successes. So like in this fund of funds, um, you know, consulting firm, basically our CEO had been around forever. Like she was an industry luminary. Um, had made crazy, crazy buddy trading and then kind of retired, did like the mom thing for like 15 years and then came back and said, okay, well, we're going to do this fun of funds product and it's going to be one size fits all and 250 million to get in the door. Or, like, don't talk to me. And, um, you know, there's a bit of arrogance to it. And when I started Typhon, I'm like, well, I'm going to do the exact opposite thing. And instead of just having this one kind of like monolithic product, where you're cl you have a very, very limited pool of clients who would put up $250 million for a brand new product. Um, I thought back to my days as a computer programmer and said, I'm gonna take a similar model, but I'm gonna break it up into components. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna go find traders who each of them have an edge, and their edge is gonna be different from everybody else's edge, and say, we're gonna offer your strategy, we're gonna have um, common operations, common infrastructure, common risk management, but investors could come and pick and choose what they want to do. So now our investor could say, hey, I want to come invest with Typhon's farmer. His name's Jared. He literally lives on a farm and he's awesome. And you could come and invest in Jared's livestock program. And maybe you could come and invest in Matt and Mike and their volatility program and kind of combine those, build your own portfolios um, and, and have something that's truly custom, uh, truly, bespoke and and I think we've done a really good job of that. I mean especially in ad trading we're consistently one of the best trading firms um, you know in, in the world and it's it's pretty cool and, and gratifying to see. But going back to, to founding it. So anyway I left this other firm and the next day I started Typhon. I formed on Illinois Secretary of State, started the process to get it like registered with the government. Um, I teamed up with this guy um, who was the chairman of the Fed Funds Pit, which Fed Funds are the interest rate futures for the very front end of the yield curve. Um, so basically it's, it's showing the rate that one, the Federal Reserve, Reserve gives a, a target rate of. So you may have heard recently that the Fed did their first rate hike since 2009. 
Um, and it's also the, the rate at which banks can essentially borrow from the Fed window at. So this guy had betrayed his own money in the Fed funds pit. He made like 500% a year, um, was just a stud of a trader. And by the time we got the business structure set up, um, got our first clients in the door, it was September 2008, which um, some of you may have remember or more likely may have heard of was kind of a interesting time in the markets. And uh, my partner, Ed, just nailed it. He's like, you know, all the chatter out there was the Fed was actually gonna hike interest rates. Um, he's like, no way, this economy is screwed. And he bought a bunch of calls for our clients on Fed funds futures. And since uh, interest rates are inverse proportional, we're betting on a, a um, betting on a rate cut. So Lehman crash, we made like 35% in a month, and within six months, we're managing $25 million. Because everybody heard about it, like, wow, these guys are awesome, everybody else is losing money. Um, we're gonna go and invest with these guys. And the thing with markets is you never know what's gonna happen, right? So the, the crash in 2008 was so bad that the government in March of 2009 cut interest rates to zero, something that's never happened in the 200 plus history of America. And they stayed at zero for seven years. So we have built this great trading strategy, trading these products, and it went away. The government said, this market is gone. And so we're now in 2016 talking about maybe bringing back that strategy, but we have built you know, business around this one specific trade that was really, really good when it worked, but poof, it's gone. And so again, in both trading and entrepreneurship, you've gotta be dynamic, you've gotta adapt. And so what we did is we, we suspended the Fed funds trading. We're like, can't really trade something that's at zero and gonna be at zero for a while. Um, and we went to Switzerland and hired this guy who was a prop trader for several big Swiss banks. Guy had an awesome track record and boom, we got like $70 million within like six months. And again, we were in kind of uncharted territory. So interest rates weren't moving. Um, a lot of his models were built on having easing and, and, and tightening cycles on interest rates. And that program kind of went flat. And the guy um, started to distrust his trading system. He wasn't really following it. And even though people were still calling me and invested in it, like I knew like in this guy's head, if he didn't trust the system anymore, he wasn't gonna make money. Um, so I had to do something pretty difficult and I fired him and I gave $60 million back to investors. And something that not a lot of people will do, not a lot of people say, well, I'm gonna risk going out of business um, to do the right thing, but I think it's something that's really important. You know, and I think a lot of people in the financial industry get driven to do things because they, they lose focus in the long term, they lose focus of the fact that they're managing other people's money, that those people trust them, and that they have, if not a legal, at least a, a moral obligation to try to do the best for them, and they don't do the right thing. They make the decision solely based on the, on the short term, and it screws those clients, and it winds up screwing them. Because like, you know, you could be a sociopath and think like the rules don't apply to you, but eventually like, Karma is going to catch up to you, and people are going to figure out if, if you don't do something the right way. Um, you know, so our philosophy is we always we always do things right in the short term, and people I think trust us and respect us in the long term. And um, you know, one I think it's the ethical thing to do, but from a business standpoint, I think it's the right thing to do too. Like if people know that you're not going to screw them, so you give up maybe. You know, maybe on that strategy, we could have kept taking management fees for another year or something, right? So I gave up like a year of revenue. But how many of those clients are gonna trust me again? Okay, like when that strategy doesn't work, they're still gonna leave, okay? And by being preemptive, by getting in front of a problem like that, you, you, you not only do the right thing, but you build that trust with your client base. So anyway, after we fired that guy, um, we're, we're introduced to this guy, Farmer Jared. Right, and so Farmer Jared is one of the nicest human beings on the face of the earth. And he was introduced uh, to us by a guy who you're gonna meet, who's now a partner in our firm, and who is the portfolio manager for our Travinci Liquid X strategy, 
guy's, guy's name is Cy Momley, he's one of my best friends, a great guy. And Cy was, this was back in like 2010 now, and Cy was running the, um, the structured grain desk at MF Global. So he was helping like farms hedge out their risk, um, helping them trade eggs, and he had this one guy, Farmer Jared, who was hedging for farms and elevators through his desk. And Cy's like, you gotta meet Jared. I'm like, okay. So he comes to my house, he drives in from Indiana, he lives on the farm in Indiana, he's got the largest horse riding arena in the state of Indiana. It is awesome. Um, but so Jared comes out, we, we talk for hours about his view on markets, what he wants to, he's only traded his prop money before, wants to go on the asset management side, our business model is set up perfectly for that. And it's like, Jared, this all sounds great. I just gotta see a track record. He's like, okay, let me call the office. Let me get the track record. So they fax us a track record. And you know, hedge fund world, you're, not, you're used to seeing like statements or like audit financials from an audit firm or something. This is a handwritten track record. Okay, it's like June plus 7.5, July plus five, like, I got to buy the facts. I know I have it somewhere, but I was not expecting to see a hammer and tracker. But you know what? I'm like, Jared, this looks awesome, but I got to see some statements. And he got me every single brokerage statement, went through, we did the accounting, we pro forma for fees, all this stuff, and it was really, really good. And hired Jared, Jared comes on as a principal type on, and you know he starts trading, and we get him up to about $50 million. Everything's good. Like, flying around the world, talking to clients, and like, farmer Jared, let's go. Like, everyone wants a piece, right? So then Halloween 2011 comes around, and if you like to say in business, like, never know what's gonna happen. Markets never know what's gonna happen. And uh, there's this firm called MF Global, and it was the world's largest commodity broker by, I think, like a factor of four. So outside of a bank, um, they, they were four times bigger than any other commodity firm. And they had about 6.7 billion in client money. Firm was worth about 44 billion. And they had brought on a CEO, this guy named John Corzine, who is a distinguished University of Chicago alum. Um, and <laughs> this guy was a former CEO of Goldman Sachs. He brought Goldman Public, made probably about $300 million. That deal went on to be the governor of New Jersey, senator from New Jersey, one of President Obama's biggest fundraisers. Um, and so Corzine had this great idea that he was gonna turn MF Global into like a global investment bank to compete with Goldman Sachs. And to do that, he decided he was gonna take this really, 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 really risky trade um, at like 30 to one leverage. And so his trade idea was good. It's basically his idea was that European governments who were under a lot of stress at the time weren't gonna default. Someone would bail them out, they'd get some kind of assistance. So he's like, I'm gonna buy all these bonds I can using a repo to maturity, like going through London and getting 30 to one leverage. Well, the problem is if you're levered 30 to one and you lose more than 3.3% mark to market, you're on a margin call. And that's assuming your credit rating stays the same. And one of the things that happened was MF Global's debt got downgraded to junk. Like the, the auditors kind of figured out what they were doing finally, which they should have been a lot earlier but they figured out exactly how much risk they were taking. There was a lot of ball in these um, European sovereigns and MF Global got downgraded. They got a margin call. And JP Morgan's like, give us our money! And what does Corzine do? He doesn't reduce the position. He doesn't just say, well, we're gonna go out of business, but he decides to take $1.6 billion out of customer segregated accounts, something that's never been done in like 180 years of commodity trading and use those to meet his market call. So that's like highly, highly illegal. Um, though he has thus far escaped criminal charges, um, MF Global goes bankrupt on Halloween uh, because of this. And they go before the judge. They're like, oh no, it's okay. There's no customer money missing. There's just an accounting error here. Like an accounting error to the tune of like $600 million. <laughs> this accounting error later grows like $1.7 um, billion. And people later realize there's no accounting error, the money is actually gone. So, what has always happened for 180 years in my trading is 
that um, if a brokerage firm goes bankrupt, the customer money is all segregated, it just transfers overnight to another brokerage firm, no one even misses a trade. Well, MF Global, because there's a shortfall, um, transfers didn't happen. A bankruptcy trustee is appointed, all the assets are frozen, MF Global, uh, or traders who clear MF Global get carried off the floor by security. Um, and trading screens, like we have trading screens that are on Google too, they go blank. Quote stop, can't execute, nothing. So it's like, that, that's not so good. Um, now, so Farmer Jared was having an incredible year. Um, I think it was up like in our livestock program, like 40% or something year to date when I went what happened. So our customer was like, whatever, let's just open an account at another broker and I will get our money back, whatever. So our clients are opening accounts, but um, I'm a, this didn't sit right with me, right? Like I'm a lawyer, I've never really practiced. Um, I happened to be in New York at the time of the bankruptcy where the bankruptcy was. And I'm like, well, I should probably do something about this. So I called this guy, Sam Tenenbaum, who's my favorite law professor at Northwestern. Uh, he runs the Investor Protection Clinic over there. And I'm like, Sam, what do I do? So Sam says, Jimmy, go get a pro hoc vice, which is Latin for temporary law license or something. Um, and file an emergency motion saying your clients need 90% of their money back. I'm like, okay. So I go and do this. Like at the time, like we're just a family business, really. It's my little sister who graduated Florida and with a degree in advertising, got herself a Series 3 license, and somehow wound up like running our operations with me. Um, me and Farmer Jared. Like we're a little tiny company, right? Um, so my sister Diana goes, figures out how to get this pro hoc DJ stuff. She's like notarizing stuff and like FedEx in New York. It takes like five days for me to get this license. And I'm preparing this motion you know, to file. Um, in the meantime, someone else had the same idea. They file a the motion, they get rejected before I'm even approved. But um, I had this call from a buddy of mine who worked at the New York Times, Azam Ahmed. And you know, he keeps checking in, in with me during this week. And so he called me first on, on actual Halloween. It's like, James, do you know what this MF Global thing is? I'm like, yeah, dude, uh, we kind of trade there. And he's like, that's great. I'm like, no, it kind of isn't because our trading screens are frozen. But he's like, well, it's great for me. I can write a story about it. So he, huh. he, uh, you know, he quotes me on the Times on Halloween, which I, I thought that was pretty cool. I'm like 30 years old, like getting quoted on the Times, right? Um, but as this stuff develops, and then I go down this, uh, you know, this, this lawyering thing, Ozum goes and writes like, Actually, it wasn't Ozzy, and someone else, else at the Times write like a profile, kind of like on what I was doing to get our customers' money back and filing this motion for an expedited return of funds. And they run this picture of me, and it's about like this big, um, standing on a street in New York in a black trench coat, looking scary, uh, on the front page of Times Business. And it's like, hmm, I kind of look fan of that. But uh, uh, whatever. The next day, we literally started getting a thousand phone calls a day in our office, like people asking us for help. Um, and it's like, we're a trading firm with four people. Um, you know, why are you calling us? And, you know, they all, they all saw the times. And I mean, it was really heart moving stuff. Like we had like a single mom saying like, she was about to buy a house. She's got two twins. Her down payment was NMF Global because she thought a segregated commodities account was the safest account in the world, which it was until Jack Horsley. Um, you know, we have farmers who are like, I'm, I'm not going to be able to buy my seed. I'm going to lose my farm. Trading companies, all their clients are like leaving in droves. And like, it, it was crazy. I mean, there were so many calls. My sister was hearing phones ringing in her sleep. And one of these calls happened to be a guy by the name of John L. Rowe, who said, told my sister, like, listen, I got a thousand customers who have accounts there. My dad's a congressman. I want to meet your brother. And my sister sent me an email that I still have, and it's like, I think you want to call this one back. <laughs> so I called John Rowe back, and John Rowe comes, like I fly back to New York after doing this filing from New York. He comes to my office, and he's like, James, we need to write a white paper, and we gotta tell the American people why MF Global is such a big deal. So we just sit down and do it. We don't say like, well, we're gonna get around to it. We just sit down there in my office, we bang it out. Rowe goes home, he edits it, he sends it out. We put it on like Twitter and LinkedIn, and like it starts going viral. So before you know it, I'm like doing 27 media interviews a day, and 
everyone is like tuning in and um, people keep calling. More more people keep calling. So my sister's like, dude, I gotta sleep. You gotta do something about this. <laughs> so we set up a LinkedIn group and say, listen, you guys gotta stop calling. We're gonna post it up on LinkedIn. I'll do a conference call every day to just like update you on what's going on. And so we do that, the phone calls chill out a little bit and then people are like, well, no one's doing anything in court, who's gonna do something, right? And uh, JP Morgan goes and they file this motion for, it's, it's called a um, motion for the use of cash collateral, which is basically like borrowing money from the bankruptcy estate to keep the holding company afloat. And um, I go and I research this motion with, with Sam. It's pretty like nefariously written. Um, I'll spare you the legalities, but this other guy, Trey Schmeltz, um, who's a lawyer here in town, Barnes Thornburg, he calls me up and he's like, hey, my client wants to sue their introducing broker, put him here, but I thought maybe I'd give you a call and see if we could actually just like get the money back instead. So Trace, with, you know, he's a big firm lawyer. These guys normally need like retainers and all sorts of stuff in order to do something. Works all weekend with Sam and I and we go over this motion and figure out that basically JP Morgan is trying to put liens on customer assets in the broker dealer rather than like in the holding company. We're like, uh oh, that ain't good. So we wind up staying at my office at like three in the morning. We write this objection. There's like a Monday, like five o'clock deadline. And we get this thing filed at 4.56 Eastern, okay? And we're the only people to object to this. It's like J.P. Morgan and their like army of bankruptcy lawyers. I think it was, I think it was Scad, it was either Scad or Simpson Thatcher representing them, but you know, thousand dollar an hour lawyers. I'm the only one to object to it. I've never appeared in court. I did like a couple hearings on my golf pro buddy who had like an $8,000 collections thing with a country club. That's it, that's my legal experience. So we file this motion. We work on prepping me again till like two or three in the morning. My sister leaves the office uh, to go pack me a suitcase um, where I'm like, hey, get, get this black suit pack so I can wear that to court the next day. Accidentally packs my tuxedo, which uh, could have been really, really <laughs> awkward if, if I didn't check before we left. But I basically wind up flying to New York the sixth day and the next day, moving there, which didn't really realize that was gonna happen. And our little LinkedIn group turned into a nonprofit organization called the Commodity Customer Coalition. So here I am thinking I'm like a hedge fund guy. I'm supposed to be like trading for people, right? But I'm like, well, they got screwed. I'm gonna get their money back. And like a week later, I am now representing 10,000 people pro bono with no experience as a 30 year old with no malpractice insurance against some of the most expensive lawyers in the world. And I mean, it's just an absolutely crazy, surreal um, situation. Um, and I'll, I'll spare you the two, you know, the recount of the two years and 3,000 hours, but long story short, like we won, we got every penny back. Um, we stuck it to, you know, I mean, really, really aggressively went after the trustee, uh, who's also the same trustee in Lehman Brothers, after JP Morgan, who had all the money that was misappropriated from the accounts. Um, they closed my bank accounts and credit cards in retaliation in the middle of this, by the way, which was pretty fun. Found out that came from Jess Staley, who was the CEO of the investment bank then, since fired, and now the CEO of Barclays, um, uh, all of Barclays. So um, really pissed off some people there. But you know, for a while I was doing TV like every single day, like in court, just hammering these guys, really not having any idea what I was doing. Um, you know, but at the end of the day, like I have all these people, you know, the, like those first phone calls that first week, like, like the single mom who's gonna like lose her house, like the guys who are gonna like lose their farm or their business, or maybe my clients who like, you know, like, well, we kind of want our money back. Um, and it, it, it's kind of a cool thing in that literally my sister, John, Sam, and some lawyers we were able to hire out of donations, um, we were able to beat like the biggest, most powerful financial institutions and law firms in the world. So, I mean, I think it's a pretty cool testament to show like the rule of law is still alive in the US, like as, as corrupt of, you know, a, a system as it, we have in a lot of ways, 
Like if you actually care, like if you actually go and really put your mind to it and like, you know, you're on the, on the right side of something, like you could win, you could beat the man. And I think that's just a really cool thing about America. Um, but anyway, getting back and closing that long tangent, right? Like being a trader, being an entrepreneur, um, like unpredictable things happen all the time. And you know, you gotta, if you're gonna do something like that, you gotta be prepared for it. Like a lot of people, like they can't max out their credit cards and have 17 cents in the bank account and be able to sleep at night. Like I can't, I'm wired where like, I don't really get rattled and you know, I believe in myself. And I knew that we were gonna make it as a business and, and you know, knock on wood, here we are like almost eight years later. Um, flip side is, in trading, we always say you never take uncompensated risk. Like risk is really important. Like if you don't take risk, you're never gonna make money. Um, and then why are your clients like paying you to trade? Um, no risk, no return, right? Um, but you should never take risk just for the sake of taking risk. And e even more importantly, in anything you do in life, you should think about the like what the risk is, quantify it, think about it. So like when I started type on. And I max out all these credit cards, and I max out my home equity line, all this stuff, right? No money in my name. Um, what if I fail? What really happens? Okay? Is someone gonna kill me? Eh, probably not. I, I stay away from the loan sharks, right? Okay, so not I don't gotta worry about dying. Am I gonna go to debtor's prison? Like we don't have this anymore. No debtor's prison. Okay? Like would I maybe have to file bankruptcy and have my credit messed up for a while? or maybe like live with my parents, like maybe, right? Well, that, that would kind of suck, but it's not the worst thing in the world, okay? So, and, and in reality, the, the answer probably would have been like, I just go get a job at a law firm, which is what I would have done if I didn't take that shot anyway. So like when I started Typhon, like I didn't have a wife, I didn't have kids, um, it's just me, right? So like I could take that risk, I could live with the, you know, the, the uncertainty and the stress there. And so, so, Basically, the risk wasn't that bad. But then if you look on the, on the flip side, like what's the reward, right? Like, you know, would I be like a unicorn? Would I be an Uber with a multi-billion dollar valuation? Probably not, at least, you know, not for a while. Like we're not a multi-billion dollar company. Like we're, you know, eight figure company. Okay, which is pretty cool. Um, but could I make a living? Like if I succeeded, a absolutely. Like could I work with people who I really trust and respect, like absolutely. And I, I gotta tell you, like we've got a group of people, you've met some of them, I mean, they're just good peeps. Like baby Alex right there, dude, baby Alex, like <laughs> he came to, to, to us, like he used to work at my brother-in-law's firm. Um, things didn't work out over there, no fault of his, lost his job, right? And I'm like, I love this guy, man, I wanna hire him, he's a good guy. And you know, he comes to me and he's like, dude, I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, well, I'm probably gonna go like park cars in the high. And I'm like, no, you ain't, man, come on over. You know, and it's like, as a business owner, you could do things like that. Like you could give people a shot. Like, and the guy, no one works harder for us than baby Alex, man. Like Thank he's you. like family to us, you Thank know? You. Like he's got something going on. He could call me at nine o'clock at night and like, I'll be like, dude, what we gotta do, you know? And that's like, the type of boss he is. I could call him at nine o'clock at night. He'll answer and give me his, uh, legal opinion <laughs> as long as it's not about work though because you know that's another thing like in, in, in typhon like you know our ops people stuff like you work like eight to five thirty like that's it like you go home you live your life like i'm not going to be texting you i'm not going to be blowing you up like needing something like an emergency fashion like you see it a lot of a lot of the big firms right and so like in a small business like and, and, and as an owner of a small business, to be able to say, like, that's a culture we're gonna have, we're gonna have a collaborative culture, we're gonna have a culture where someone always does the right thing and we're gonna treat every single person in the firm like with respect and take care of them like their family. Like, I do that any single day of the week over being at one of the big hedge funds where like I have no life and people are throwing phones at you and, and it's just like ultra competitive where it's all it is about the money. And you know we make money generally. I mean, past performance is not necessarily indicative of future returns. If you regulators are listening at home, but you know we generally have made money for our clients. Like people who stick by us, like they have done well. Um, but it's not at the expense of everything else. And you know I think is when you guys are, are 
and gals are you graduate and you're looking at the workforce and you're gonna you're gonna have you're gonna have big hedge funds you're gonna have big banks like throwing money at you right and I think you really gotta sit and, and take a look at what their culture is like you know are you gonna enjoy yourself like are you gonna have fun at work is it intellectually stimulative like do you have the opportunity you know to go, to do like good outside of work like like a Typhon man like how many other jobs could you say hey boss I'm gonna go and spend two years doing pro bono litigation like <laughs> sister run the business right i mean like that's just that's just not a realistic thing like not a lot of people could do that and you know luckily like we had great technology my sister is a badass part of my french and was able to you know handle the business there um but being in that entrepreneurial type structure like you could go out and do stuff that really matters so you know down the road right like we never know like how long any of us are going to be here like i could be like slip on some ice and fall and break my neck on the way to the car after this, right? You, you never know. And like, if that happens, am I gonna be thinking about like that awesome trade I made one time? Or like, you know, if I was working 110 hour weeks to, you know, make a little bit more money so I can have a little bit more nicer car. Like, you're not gonna think about any of that stuff. You're gonna think about like the people that mattered and like, more importantly, like what you have done for other people to make their lives just a little bit better. And you know, I'm only 35, hopefully, you know, I got, I got I got a little more gas in the tank, but I mean, I can honestly say, like, I get hit by a bus today. Like, I have had an awesome life, man. Like, I've had fun. Like, I've taken risk. I've been successful there. But like, when people have needed me and I've been in a position to help, like, I did it. Like, I went on. I took the man on. Like, I got their property back. And not a lot of people can say that. And you know, people have different skills. Like, not everyone can like get in a courtroom and like take people on, but a lot of people could go like volunteer at an animal shelter or like they could go tutor or, you know, do other things like a, you know, pro bono, like in a charitable manner that goes beyond <laughs> just markets and just like taking alpha out and, you know, trying to be the like one microsecond faster. And like all that stuff's cool. Like we all gotta pay the bills, we all gotta eat. But you know, the one thing I say is when you graduate and you know you come into this financial world, like don't do it with blinders on. Like don't do it in isolation. Like do things that are gonna make you happy. That's gonna make the world just a little bit better. And you know a lot of people don't do that. A lot of people lose sight. Like a lot of lawyers look at how many hours they could bill, and like they gotta pay their kids private school, or they wanna fly first class instead of coach. Like that stuff matters. Like if you get hit by a bus, like you're not gonna be thinking about that stuff. You know, so, so, man, make it, you know, make it count, like, do things for people, like, help people, like, it's just, it's awesome feeling, you know, and so, like, at least, I, and look, I don't know what it's like to be on that other side of the fence, I don't know what it's like to just be, like, all in on, like, the making money thing, or the punch on the clock thing, but, like, I'll tell you, like, you know, when I go home, I go to sleep, I put my head on the pillow, I am out, okay, I know every day, I expended all the energy I had at being having fun or working or like doing cool stuff for people. Um, and I'm never up at night like with regret or like, you know, worried like maybe I didn't do enough. Like, it's just, it's just a cool way to live. Like, it's a cool way to live that every day you go to bed with a smile on your face and you're like, I gave it all I had. And, you know, every day is not going to be like that. But like the more. The more days where at the end of the day you could look back and say like I did something, I made a difference, I had fun, like the happier you're going to be your whole life. So, you know, go out, do your quantitative stuff, you know, make a lot of money, but don't do that in isolation. And uh, I don't know, I think that's all I got. Let's, let's, let's take some questions. Someone, come on. <laughs> I have a question. Baby Alex. Um, you said you got 90% of the customers. Yeah, every back. penny back. Every, oh, and I can't say I, right? Like, first of all, that's what I we in the CCC and like, you know, the trustee had a huge part to play in that, right? But the pressure we put on them, sped up that case a couple years, decreased the amount of legal fees that got billed to the customers mm -hmm. exponentially. And, uh, 
you know, guys like J.P. Borkin don't like people calling for boycotts of them on national TV, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, every, every penny. Perfect, thank you. How many trading strategies do you employ at uh, Python Capital? I mean, are they discretionary? Are they algo-driven? Yeah, we can keep this close. Absolutely, yeah. We, we, uh, we run a mix of programs, right? So half our firm is discretionary ag. And so on the ag side, um, it's generally fundamental. I mean, we do have quantitative and technical components to it. Um, we do do a lot of like kind of information flow-based trading, like we're affiliated with one of the largest crop insurance agencies um, in, in the US. So we get a lot of data um, based on how those guys are hedged, what, what kind of insurance they're buying, stuff like that. Um, GRA does also a lot of hedge business for commercials. Um, so that information flow, which by the way is completely legal in the futures market, um, you know, is very helpful uh, you know, to trade on and all the best agriculture CTAs are trading based on, on fundamental data. Um, so the other half of the firm is systematic in nature. We don't do any like HFT, um, but we have like a currency day trading product that's kind of momentum slash like risk budgeting base. Uh, Matt and Mike Thompson run our, our VIX products. Um, so you guys met them and, and heard a lot about that. But basically what they're doing is a bi-directional um, VIX trade. So the VIX is the volatility index. It's, it's there for people to go hedge their equity exposure basically. Um, most users of the VIX are what we call happy losers and that they want to make money on their equities. They don't want to make money on their VIX. So they're, they're putting that VIX on hoping that they never need it. Kind of like insurance. You never really want to need your health insurance, but you know, you're glad it's there when you do. Um, so basically they're on the other side of the trade from the hedgers, kind of like what you do on the ag side, right? Like on the ag side, you're essentially trying to harvest hedge premium out of the market. Um, that's what the VIX guys are doing about 70% of the time. So they'll be short a synthetic VIX spread uh, where they kind of want to roll down the curve, take decay out of that. So VIX is something that decays very, very quickly. Um, on average, you're looking four to 6% a month decay there. Um, so if you look at a product like Barclays issues the VXX exchange traded note, which is uh, an easy point and click way that even retail investors can access a volatility exposure. That ETN has done 99.6% since inception um, after adjusting for like reverse stock splits and stuff like that. So that product is there to give you a short term VIX exposure, but that product kind of rolled its futures contracts every day and that roll is very, very expensive. And that decay of being long is very expensive. So 70% 70, 70 of the time, we're on the same side as Barclays is, as the issuer, and, and we're um, trying to make money by harvesting the decay. Now, their model then goes and looks at the entire term structure of volatility. So if you think of vol as a yield curve, so to speak, like you've got essentially three modes. You could be contango, you, which is the normal structure, um, which we roll down the curve. You can be backwardated. That generally means, uh oh, bad stuff's going to be happening. Be happening probably. Um, or you could be flat. So if the term structure looks kind of flat, we really have no edge there. We're not going to be long or short. We get out of the market. Um, when the curve goes backward, that is one of these telltale signs that markets like something's wrong. The market structure thinks. Um, we could, we could see a systemic event. Like Lehman, for example, was, it was, was uh, predicated by an inversion of that VIX curve to backwardation. So if the curve goes backward, our model looks and says, well, is this gonna be like a short term, well, spike and then mean revert? Which if, if we think that, then the Thompsons will go and get short um, vol again and, and play that mean reversion. But if it thinks it's gonna be a swell of volatility, that that vol is going to continue and accelerate, um, then we get long vol. And, and that's generally where that product um, you know, makes the most money. And then um, our, our final product is a momentum macro strategy. So it's a relatively simple methodology. It's kind of a, a subset of trend following where it's looking at 27 different commodity markets. It's looking at kind of taking those markets, breaking them down into sectors, and then looking for breakouts either to the long side or the short side, and then trying to get on those, um, those breakouts with a, a relatively short-term 
trade, so it'll be one month or less um, in, in either long or short direction where trend followers, they will, will have up to like 200 markets on at a time. They'll have trades on for two, three years. They'll take like 20% drawdown, stuff like that. Um, so this is something that, that kind of has a similar um, mindset, but it's much shorter term and focused, and it's a lot fewer markets. Like we'll never be in more than seven markets at a time because we only want to be in markets where we have edge um, and we see a potential breakout. Like we don't want to have risk on, just for the sake of having risk on, um, and just have a trade sit there for, for no reason. Comment. In, in terms of uh, customer, I mean, I'm assuming you're still managing customer assets. Yeah. 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 How, how do you, how do you, like what type of risk due diligence do you do in terms of when you bring in customers, figuring out which one of these products is appropriate for them, or, or is it just, the, I mean, the, the minimum account size is, you know, a million dollars or whatever, and therefore you're exempt from having to jump through all of those hoops. No, I mean, we, we take like the know your customer type stuff really, really seriously. So now we're, by law, um, the way we're, we're registered, we only take assets from what are known as qualified eligible participants. Um, so that's an individual with either, with two million liquid net worth or more, or um, an investment vehicle with five million net worth or more that wasn't formed for the specific purposes of investing in our products. Um, so our, our investors are generally pretty sophisticated. Um, and most of ours actually, we won't put them in something. They'll come to us and say, we want your grain strategy. We want your VIX strategy, whatever. And, and a lot of that's a, just a quantitative screen. So like we're crunching data on all of our products. We're saying like, what ex what, how much exposure do we have every day? what the P&L is every day, and a lot of institutions will take that data and they will run correlation analysis and uh, analyses, uh, like look at the covariances, do what, whatever kind of like analytical screen that their investment process dictates and say, well, like I want this data. I, that's basically what they say, we want this data, right? And, and some of them will come in, they'll, especially on the X, I want to talk to the portfolio managers, like get a feel for their personality, um, but I'd say most of it is, is, is data driven. That being said, the due diligence process that they do on us is, is far deeper than what we do on them, right? Like we talk to them about their investment experience, how much money they have, all of that. But like, they, like bigger investors, especially like they'll come in, um, did, Alex, did they meet Michelle? No. Okay. Well, they'll, they'll come in, they'll talk to like a director of operations is Michelle Stewart. Like, They'll talk to Alex, they'll talk to me, they'll talk to Clue about our, our processes, right? So they'll talk, like, how do we run our investment committee? How do we run our risk committee? Like, what are our risk guidelines? Like, at one, what point do we, at the, the executive team, intervene with the portfolio manager? Like, when would we have them reduce risk? When would we have them increase risk? Um, they care a lot about that. They care a lot about, like, our technology. Like, um, how are we treating their data? Um, like, do we have proper separation or of roles, like, you know, like I'm on the legal compliance side, I also meet with clients and stuff, um, Who who's covering me? Like if I'm not in the office, like, what, you know, what's Michelle gonna do, what's Alex gonna do, what's Clue gonna do? So they, they talk a lot about that, um, and you know, they get into like verification of track records, like a lot of people like falsify their track records, like at like Madoff, right? Um, so they get in, they look at the account, and we go like straight to brokerage statements, and so, look, here's the net asset value, and like, Here's a contract where we go and redact, redact, uh, redact um, the customer information, but say, here's your trading level, here's where it increased, here's where it decreased, do the trading statements match that, right? So we, um, we spend a lot of time on stuff like that. Like we'll get 30 page questionnaires talking about like what we do in this scenario, what we do in that scenario, what's this person's background, what's that person's background? So, um, in the wake of all, kind of, all, all the like fraud that's happened in the investment management industry in the last 10 years, like the diligence has gone up exponential. And it, it's something that we as a firm are, are, are quite good at. Sir? Yeah, I have a question about your uh, background. Um, so I think we're in our master's program. I, I just want to wonder, uh, did you get your JD right after undergrad or so right what after. was your consideration when you decided to pursue a further education? 
Um, so I mean, the honest answer is Florida was a really big school, right? So like, I, I didn't apply there. They kind of like bribe my parents and stuff. Um, funny thing is I actually did apply to U Chicago. My dad made me apply there because um, it was one, it's one of the few like really high-end schools that takes like natural art scholarships, um, or at least it did back when I was in high school. Um, and I was a little scared of Chicago, I'm not gonna lie. I mean, you guys, you guys work hard, right? So I kinda, I kinda sabotaged my essay a little bit. I'm like, listen, okay, if I got a choice between like going out on a Friday night and studying for a test, like, I'm going out. So, um, you know, I, I got waitlisted here. And, uh, you know, I, I had fun in Florida, I really did. But I mean, it wasn't, I, I think I probably would have benefited from a more intellectually rigorous school like UFC. Um, so, you know, Florida was something where a lot of our classes were on TV replay, um, which I didn't watch. And, you know, I was running my business. I had like operations in five states doing like an IT um, consulting business. So like I played hockey for Florida and I'd like fly in if I had a hockey game or test and otherwise I'm like in Vegas or LA like running my, you know, my other business. So I, long story short, after four years there, I was like, mm, I kind of want to go to you know a big time school and like get a real education, and and Northwestern uh, let me in. So, but yeah, I did go straight through from from undergrad, which Northwestern is pretty rare. I think it's like ninety percent have at least one year work experience between college and um, and law school. But I. I've been working basically full time since I was 15 and like, you know, running a business with operations in five states. So they're like, yeah, you're good. <laughs> so how do you view the relationship or connection between the high phone and your pro bono audition? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting relationship. It's gotten a little more complicated as we've grown. So basically when my sister and I own the, the whole firm, like, yeah. You know, we thought it was important. We thought it was, was something that we, we, you know, really needed to do. Um, we didn't have to get like board approval or any kind of partnership vote. Um, so now, like since like we did the, the merger with Travinci and they've got a, a stake in the business, um, it's a little more delicate, right? So like one of our like our CRO Satish Nandaprakar like worked at CME with um, you know guys who I was on the board of the regulator with and. Um, while I was there, one of those dudes decided he was going to falsify documents in conjunction with the NFA's general counsel to um, basically get the guys who set the co executive compensation at the regulator there reelected after I showed that they didn't follow their their bylaws for doing so. So you know that one was a little less kind of drop. Like MF Global, we were like, well, you're getting money back for, for victims of a bankruptcy, like woo hoo hoo. Like no one's gonna say like that's a bad thing. Um, but you know, the future of the world is very, very <coughs> tight knit world. I mean, it's very Chicago in in, in a way and, and not in a good way. Um, you know, so like that regulator I was on, you know, I I probably use the word corrupt, right? I mean, like you you had four different frauds happen on their watch. Um, in like 10 years, and they responded by jacking executive pay. Like I think in the three years I was on the board, executive pay went up like 35%, okay? And when, when they did a deal with someone who was actually on the board right before me, and they contracted with their firm to do di uh, daily balance verification for the regulator, they didn't do any due diligence on that. They didn't audit them. They didn't know that, oh, they were insolvent to the tune of $25 million, okay? And that was something that that firm wound up going bankrupt. Um, we went to liquidate the firm, and management took no steps to secure the cash. So you had $900 million in cash that had to go back to customers after the company that the regulator actually was doing business with um, and went bankrupt. Um, I. I had heard from my friends inside that firm that their CEO was possibly planning to steal all that money and move overseas, and it was actually like overseas at the time. Um, and because I was on that board, I was able to force them to put an external accounting firm in there to make sure that money was stolen. 
okay? And you know, you'd think guys who are making close to a million dollars a year would know to take that basic auditing step, but they don't. And like the management of that organization runs it solely for their own benefit in order to keep the, you know, their pay going on. And, and you know, so the guy who wanna falsify the documents in con conjunction with the re-election of the guys who sit on the compensation committee is there because his mom was the secretary for like Leo Malamed and Jack Sander who are like, you know, luminaries of the futures industry. And you know, you just have this like cronyism and corruption and you know, that's a battle I decided to fight and to fight publicly and went public with my whistleblower. And that one people weren't too happy with. My business partners were not happy with that. Um, you, the industry response, like you've had people, um, so I just lost this election by two votes with 20% turnout or so. Um, so one, no one really cares, but you know, two, the guys who are in that club, the guys who are friends with, with, with the people who are, are doing this bad stuff, the regulator, like they're going out calling me like divisive and untrustworthy and like saying that I should resign in order to hold management accountable. I'm like, mm, I'm not the one who falsified documents. So, you know, it's something that, that in the sake of our business, I have dialed back with and I think kind of everyone, myself included, is happy that I'm no longer on that board because um, having a duty of loyalty to a, and a fiduciary duty to a corrupt organization is a really hard thing to do for someone with my personality. Um, but I'm flying to New York next Thursday. I'm giving more testimony to the CFTC under my whistleblower complaint. So I am gonna make sure that those guys are held accountable for falsifying documents, which is not a cool thing for a regulator to do. Did I see someone over here? Uh, for people who are looking to get started in the trading industry uh, or the hedge fund industry with, uh, you know, uh, what, what kind of advice could you give them uh, in terms of where to start? Or, or, or you know, most of the students here have solid math, science, statistics backgrounds. I mean, I obviously get a master's in financial mathematics here at the university. So what would you recommend if the interest is in pursuing careers in trading? What would you recommend as a first step? Well, so the first step, you guys have already taken it and you took the right first step because like U U of C is considered like worldwide, like the best place for financial engineering and mathematics. So like congratulations on being at like the premier um, school for that. Um, and I will say like the, the big hedge funds, HFT shops, prop shops, like they love U of C, they love pure, pure science, pure math like way more important than having like a financial background, like a finance degree is like, who cares? But like, um, you know, like my brother-in-law, for example, worked at, worked at Citadel for nine years. He's a Valley ass, he's absolutely brilliant. Uh, he was an electrical engineering um, major at, at Stanford. So anything engineering, pure science, like that is, is where you want to start before going into the, the working world. Um, you know, that being said, I don't, I don't know a whole lot about the actual curriculum here but I would say take as many programming classes as you can. Like a computer programming is absolutely invaluable. Um, and if you, know, if you could write any algos or you know, write software, like if you've got that plus a financial background, like you could write your own ticket. I mean, you really can. Um, so, cause I mean, there are not enough programmers out there. I mean, hell, I still write a lot of our software on top of everything else that we do just cause like I can't afford you know, million dollar salaries for experience like financial programmers. I mean, like people people really make bank um, if you know like finance and programming. Um, you know, that being said, like, you know, internships are really important, like, you know, in the summers uh, before you graduate, I mean, so, you know, you need to, I think a lot of the firms recruit, and you guys would know better than me, but like six, eight months out the summer, is that about right? 10 months, maybe. Um, you know, apply, like those internships are really coveted. Um, but, you know, if you could get in with like a Goldman or here in town, like a Citadel or Belly um, I mean, have, getting that experience, like learning the way that they look at markets, the way they design their technology, um, super, super beneficial to your career. Because, um, you know, and a lot of these firms too, they want to hire fresh out of school. They want people who, You've got all the analytical skills. Um, you've got the um, capacity to be a, a good trader, developer, or an analyst. 
um, but you don't have preconceived biases, right? So like every firm kind of treats, trains people a little bit different, like you trade on your own. Like someone like me, I've never worked in a big firm, okay? So I mean like my views on markets, like they're, they're mostly self-taught. I mean like Johannes and like when I was at Smith Barney in, in high school, like they gave me a little bit of kind of insights there, but you know, most of the way I look at trades is very, very different than the way like a Citadel looks at trades. So, you know, if you want to go into like that big firm world, like it's really best to do a rival school. It's gonna differ based on your personality and like what you're really looking to do, but I would say that the top talent is probably at the big hedge fund slash prop shops. Um, you know, banks pre like Volcker Rule and Dodd Frank when they were doing internal trading, like that was kind of you know the gold star, but they've really had to pare down their trading operations and their, their prop um, for regulatory reasons. So a lot of those people have gone to the hedge fund and, and the prop world. So I mean, I, I would look at I would look at prop and hedge fund pretty much interchangeable. Um, you know, depending on the program, depending on like what kind of experience that they would give you. Um, but I would kind of put banks below that. You mentioned that you know you have your own view of markets, which can differ substantially from kind of uh, some of the larger firms or some of the conventional wisdom. I thought maybe it would be fun for the students to hear. Uh, we talk a lot in our classes. We, we teach them kind of classic models and then the more cutting edge models, but we also try to teach them to to think critically and that it's okay to have differing views. I wonder if you would share uh, during this time of pretty volatile markets recently. What's one of your unconventional views uh, about the markets and what's going on right now? Sure, so I mean, I've always taken a, kind of a, a, like a behavioral psychology approach to looking at markets and like I feel I could see like fear and greed in charts and at the end of the day, that's what all markets come down to. Fear, greed, supply, demand, however you wanna call it. Um, since 2009, we've been in, in really uncharted territory. You've got the combination of uh, the currency wars that are going around uh, worldwide, where every country is essentially saying, we want to devalue our currency, devalue our currency, be um, export friendly, right? You have that combined with, with low interest rates, I mean, near zero interest rates, um, where a lot of people thought were going to be hyperinflationary, right? But um, they haven't been, in fact, in fact you'd argue that They've been very inflationary on an asset bubble side, but um, deflationary for a general economy side. And, and I mean, I think the real reason behind that is you gotta look at the velocity of money, okay? And the way the, I mean, the way most of the world has approached like response to the 2008 crisis has been through a monetary policy standpoint. There has not been fiscal standpoint or, or fiscal stimulus really at all um, and you also haven't taken the medicine on a lot of stuff. I mean, you've got a lot of debts that were, I mean, some of them have recovered. A lot of these like housing CDOs or whatever have bounced back, um, but you've got a lot of kind of dead weight in the system that hasn't been flushed out. So when you talk about like capitalistic theory, um, the, the principle of like creative destruction is like really important. Like that's why you have competition, even though competition is essentially wasteful if you've got multiple companies all doing the same thing, um, it drives innovation because you're, you're trying to, to beat other people out and you know people go out of business and it you know, flushes it out and you can buy assets on the cheap and they get um, rolled into another company. Like we didn't really see that happen. I mean we saw um, we saw like the 2007, 2008 like US Fed take 
almost like a roulette approach to to handling the crisis, right? I mean, you had like Bear Stearns, they went down. A lot of people argue that they didn't have to fail, that it, you know, that they were kind of driven into bankruptcy. Then boom, they're scooped up by J.P. Morgan. Uh, you know, uh, or before they went into bankruptcy, they were just bought, right? And then you had WAMU, um, that was, again, scooped up by J.P. Morgan. Then you had Lehman, it's like, eh, we're just gonna let Lehman fail. World goes into crisis, and then Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs are, and AIG are just all bailed out, right? So we had no real consistent policy response to that. We had no consequence or moral hazard for risk-taking um, there, or, or, or for misdeed. I mean, we haven't seen one senior executive prosecuted for any kind of fraud or misconduct in, in 2008. So you see those behaviors persist in markets. You see those bad debts persist in markets, and um, it's an interesting comment, right? Because you've had basically a seven-year bull market in equities, it's driven by these zero percent interest rates and by stock buybacks and really kind of perversions in um, the public company space. And that companies like Apple, who've got you know hordes of multi multi billion dollars of cash going out and borrowing to take advantage of low interest rate, and then using that borrow to like buy stock back and stuff. I mean, it, it, it's not a healthy way um, to, to structure a, a capitalistic system. And you know now you're seeing China seeing some, some capitalistic realities. I mean, like China has a lot of you know, strong demographics and its workforce and its cheap currency and good amount of natural resources and um, has really allowed them to be a major industrial player, but economies don't go straight up. Okay, you need consolidation, you need bankruptcies, you need that uh, creative destruction. We're, we're starting to see a little bit of that now. And then, you know, oil, um, I mean, it's a really, really, really interesting market right now. And um, oil is kind of the number one indicator of, of global demand. Um, global demand is, is slowing. I mean, it is, like industrial production is slowing. You've got like Iran or Iran coming off of sanctions here. They're flooding the market. You've got o OPEC that was in there trying to crush all the frackers here and basically sell oil um, at a price too low. Um, to make fracking profitable. And because of that, you have bank lenders out there who've got trillions of dollars in exposure um, to, to the oil space, right? So, I mean, oil has ripped higher the last two days. Um, you know, we'll see if it's bottom. I mean, it's, the, it's generally the fastest mean revert, reverting commodity out there, um, but maybe it goes lower here. And, you know, I think if you see prolonged um, oil weakness, I think that weakness could spill over in the financial sectors and you could see kind of a, a redux of, of 2008. Um, so I mean, I think we're in really, really interesting times. I mean, I, I think that, um, I mean, now it's, it's been shown that we essentially had a, a double top here in you know, August where we sold off, we rallied back, now we're down again. Um, I mean, I think that we will see further weakness here. I think it's overdue. I don't know if it's going to be right now or down the road, but um, structurally global markets have not, um, you know, they've not flushed out what happened in 08. And also from a business cycle perspective, I mean, we've had seven years of, of straight, you know, stock market performance and, and, you know, things do not go on forever. Like people, when you hear people say like, it's different this time, um, like that's when you need to, um, you know, be, be, be cautious. And um, that being said, the central banks do not want this party to end. They want markets to go higher. They don't want a recession anywhere. Um, so we'll see, people are gonna be cutting currencies. People are gonna keep rates at zero. I mean, I personally think that the Fed here, if we went to a 1% Fed funds rate, and like we actually follow through on these four coordinated hikes, that would be more stimulative to the economy uh, than going back down to zero. I think that that one of kind of the basic things that make the business cycle work are easing and tightening cycles. And when people say, okay, rates are going higher, that makes them go out and buy. That makes them go buy a house now or go buy a car now, because if they need that, they're gonna do it now. Yeah. Well, well in regards to that, I mean, typically the two mandates of the Fed are employment and inflation. Given that they are apparently zero, 
anywhere in the horizon. You're not seeing it on wage pressures. You're not seeing it on any other metric that they actually like to look at. Why would the Fed raise interest rates? See, I actually think that raising rates, and not high, I'm not saying let's go to Volcker as 16% or something. I think a 1% Fed funds rate is more inflationary than zero. I think that when you're in zero um, rate environment, it tends to be deflationary for the real economy. I mean, look at Japan. Japan's been doing QE for 20 years, and they've had no inflation because of that. Um, and if you could actually have a tightening cycle where you get that velocity of money to increase, that it's kind of paradoxical, but, but small rate increases become inflationary. So which is driven by the fear that rates are going to be higher. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, if you look at a 1% Fed funds, I mean, you're talking at like 5% 30-year mortgages, right? I mean, that's, that's not something that, yeah. Okay, but, but you know, if we go back to like after um, September 11th, Right, and, and the housing bubble, a lot of um, Fed watchers, economists say that the fact that, that Greenspan kept the Fed funds rate at one for so long is the reason that we, we created that bubble, right? I mean, it's still very, very stimulative, accommodative um, Fed policy at one. So I'm not saying to hike, to put the brakes on, I just think that QE in perpetuity, it's gonna stimulate stock markets, but it doesn't stimulate lending, it doesn't stimulate the real economy, it doesn't stimulate small businesses. So that, that one to two percent Fed funds is, is you know, where I would go if I wanted to see the, the recovery extent. And I, I think you gotta do stuff on the fiscal side too. But. Any more questions? Ooh, I'm done. All right. yeah. What's up? Oh, baby Alex,